Heil, in his book, Evangelism as Exiles, Elliot Clark points out that our conduct is critical to our witness as exiles. We must remember that our neighbors are watching. They all know if our walk matches our talk. Our extended family, friends, co-workers, and children can all see if our faith is real. And one way God has ordained for them to be drawn to Christ is through the visible, observable testimony of our holiness. They need to see we're different, that we're like our Father, and that our deeds are good. Only then, as we shine before others, will some of them actually see the light. And this is precisely the point the Apostle Peter is making in his epistle when he says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And he applies this command in the succeeding verses by telling believers to honor the government authorities and render honest, excellent work, irrespective of the quality of treatment they receive in the workplace. Not content with addressing life in the public arena, Peter then moves into that most difficult of realms, the believer's home life. And that is the area that is being refined right now during our enforced home confinement. Peter says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the wearing of gold, or the putting on of clothing. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good and not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Peter addresses the women first because their need was more pressing. During those days, the family normally followed the husband's choice. So, Ladies who became followers of Jesus while married to unbelieving men were often put in a difficult situation. That's why Peter gives the encouragement to do good and not to fear anything that is frightening. To these embattled ladies, he counsels submission to their husbands. This is not simply an accommodation to the values of the time, neither was it a strategy of pragmatic appeasement. Rather, if we understand his command in light of Paul's description of spirit-empowered family life in Ephesians 5 and 6, a wife's submission to her husband is the outworking of the gospel. One lives within the divinely ordained hierarchy, acknowledging that the husband is the head of the wife, just as Jesus is the head of the church. That Peter shares Paul's perspective is quite clear since he points ladies to the example of Sarah, who was submissive to Abraham. So it is a timeless command that transcends cultural and social boundaries. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he encourages these sisters by holding out to them the hope that by their submissive demeanor and chaste behavior, they might make the gospel so attractive that their unbelieving husbands might be won to Christ. And lest you think this is just a wish, let the testimony of Augustine of Hippo concerning his mother give credence to the possibility of this hope. He says, She served her husband as her master and did all she could to win him for you, speaking to him of you by her conduct, by which you made her beautiful. Finally, when her husband was at the end of his earthly span, she gained him for you. Peter is encouraging these ladies to press the claims of the gospel upon their husbands by being radically different from other women in society. Instead of being superficial, self-absorbed women focused on external beauty and appearance, they were to display the beauty of character 
that is the result of a heart transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, let us not put a guilt trip on women whose husbands continue to resist the gospel. It is God who saves at his sovereign pleasure. But whether or not a godly woman's husband is converted, she can be assured that God values the imperishable beauty of her character. As for believing men, they are to show the life-changing impact of the gospel by being gentle and understanding toward their wives. Then as now, this is radical behavior because we are so twisted by sin, our natural tendency is to dominate our families and assert our selfish desires. Instead, Peter commands us to be considerate towards our wives because they are physically weaker, and thus the weaker vessel, and to give them honor. This in itself shows the radical nature of the gospel. In a culture where women were practically second-class citizens, Peter declares them co-heirs of salvation. He is asserting that before God, men and women are of equal worth and standing. In fact, Peter ties the effectivity of men's prayers to the way they treated their wives. And this stands to reason because a self-centered husband will rarely, if ever, pray in accordance with God's purposes. And I think we all realize that being under lockdown with our family exposes our continuing need for God's transforming grace. Being stuck with our kids and our spouse makes us see how far we fall short of Peter's Spirit-inspired command. The bottom line for Peter's admonition to both men and women is that the gospel must transform every aspect of life. There is not one square inch of our lives where Jesus Christ does not say, Mine. And our faithfulness as witnesses depends on our submission to his claims of ownership. Make no mistake, the quality of our lives does not make the gospel more true. But demonstrating the lordship of Christ in our lives makes our witness more credible to a watching world. Our hope is that God is at work refining our character in the midst of our struggles. May we then, by the grace of God, grow in holiness that we may be truly compelling witness for Christ, for his glory.